Thanks for tuning in today, friends. This episode is gonna cover questions you have about family dynamics, because let's be honest, it's hard. We're gonna talk through questions that'll cover different relational hardships with your parents, your children, and many more. So we're also gonna dive into topics, talking about God, forgiveness, honoring our parents, and get ready for it, generational curses, right? Mm. So before we get into the content though, I have to let you know that our team put together a really helpful listener guide that you can download for free using the link in the show notes. It's a summary of our discussion and it'll be helpful for you as you unpack what we discuss and take your own notes, as well as a good reference for you if you have conversations with your friends or family. Now, let's dive into today's content. Okay, first question. My adult children have a strained relationship and are not on speaking terms. How do I navigate this as a mom? And this was a question that not just one listener sent in. So I think this is a very real dynamic. So, Jim, Joel, who wants to tackle it? I'll jump in first on that. (laughs) I've seen this by the hour. Uh, many, many times, and that is start by recognizing and embracing as the parent your lack of control over your adult children and their sibling relationships. Because think about it, when they were little, you're still our little, um, and relatively speaking, there was a lot of control, we quite frankly did. So we're wired that we can control our kids. I, you two apologize to each other, all like that. Once they're in that adult world, I think, and I feel that in my own with my own adult kids at times, if there's a conflict, my wife and I would look and say, hey, because I, I can tend to want to rescue and step in. Hey, wait, can we we all get that? It's like, no, they have to work that out and sort that out. I want to, old theme for me, it's been in this podcast series already many times, pay attention to your own internal world. What about my kids? Stop. Look inside what's going on. Your own fight, flight, or freeze. Are you in judgment? Well, I probably wasn't a good parent, or I know I was, or they're embarrassing me out there, or the longing and hurt that our kids are not, maybe one or two, they're not getting along and turning into that self-condemnation or shame. And then just remember, blame if you're blaming yourself or someone else is often blamed, is often an attempt to discharge pain. And the last one I'll say is, which is this gets right to the crux of the matter. It's hard. It's been hard for me. Avoid triangulation with your adult children at all. What does that mean? Yeah, but this kind of, I mean, if we're over here talking about with one of my adult kids about one of the other ones, it's trying to be helpful. It's like, sure, maybe some, I'm a human, I'm real, but often it's going to get into triangulation that watch, I'm no longer talking to you and you talking to me. We're going out through one of your siblings or their in-laws, you know, spouse, what have you. And so I would watch and the one I see the most of is triangulation, just a little bit of well, let me talk with you about one of your siblings. And the danger of that is that person can say, well, if you talk to me about them, well, you can talk to them about me and the conduit and it circles back. And then your own child, whether they are deconstructing and have faith issues or just whatever, they can say, I feel betrayed by you because you talked behind my back. I would just say, be alert, be warned of these things. Now, let me take the question a little further. What if there's a desire on one or both parts to come together, but there's been so much animosity and one of your kids comes to you and says, I could really use some advice how to handle this. Is it Mm -hmm. appropriate to then say, well, are you open to a thought? And then maybe sharing some perspective, not choosing sides, but rather helping them see something that they may be missing in the dynamic. And one thing that I think is could be particularly helpful is if they're open to a thought and you can ask them, are you open to a thought? Mm -hmm. Um, Let me share with you. If I were in this situation, there's always the facts of the disagreement, but then there's the story underneath it. Right. And so maybe do some investigation about help me understand why you would feel this way and give them some advice of questions that they could ask Mm -hmm. that can provide for productive conversations I know we've even worked on the healthy conversations contract, you know, and um, providing resources or providing some healthy perspectives and some wisdom um, may not be bad, but I agree with you. We don't want to get into the place where we're trying to rescue or we're trying to get into the drama of the event. I like that. And again, you know, same song, second verse again to say to your adult kids, because I've done it. I think it's beautiful what you've said. And to say, let me start with son or daughter. What is this hitting in you? 
what is what is what's going on in you? Not what do you have to own? I am going to move to that eventually and say, is there is there any place where you are wrong? And I'm looking, quite frankly, I'm listening and looking for ownership that that person would say, um, you know, I, I can take ownership. I see that I may have provoked or may have done something. I tell them, you know, we're often down on what we're not up on. There's, we've How many times have we use on the podcast? As much as it depends on you, you know, as far as it's in your power, all that, live at peace with all people. And sometimes it's just like, we're just not wired there to necessarily just like the other person. But what is what are the buttons, if this person's pressing buttons in you, and I teach all my clients, those buttons are not newly installed. They were installed in childhood or family of origin. What's it hitting in you? And then what do you feel like you're willing to do to be able to have said conversation with that person, as Brene Brown's taught us, our, our kids in those positions, all of us together, we're either going to be in empathy or judgment. And empathy with a sibling you're maybe not hanging out with or you're a little bit you know, separated from or whatever. The idea of empathy is to say, I want to try to understand you, to seek first to understand you before I'm understood. Quite frankly, what I see a lot of, I guess probably mostly, is people just aren't willing. No, this is the other person's problem. We quoted James 4 on this. Why are there fightings and quarrels among you, even among siblings? There's something you want and you're not getting it. Something's at war within you. So I love to say, can can me, can mom or dad, can we, let's go into your heart and soul. What's going on for you? And then from there, I can say, well, you know, what I'm going to avoid there. I'm going to avoid trying to avoid that triangulation. Say, well, you've got a valid point. They shouldn't have said that. I think that gets dicey. This is going to be messy, right? Because I am in the middle. I want to be very wise about being a parent of adult children in the middle. Okay. I think there's a um, exercise that the ancient rabbis oh. can maybe um, help us uh, with on this one. And one of the ways that rabbinic teaching was done was through invitation of learning through questions. Mm. Um, notice how many times Jesus doesn't give answers. Mm -hmm. Like the disciples ask him a question. He's like, hmm. And he tells a story. <laughs> Or he tells a parable, or he asks ask them another question. question back to them. Love it. Yeah. Um, I think this could be a very powerful way to exercise uh, a way to invite your adult children into self exploration by you first exploring some questions um, to discuss and ask instead of finding the need to give the answer um, and then framing the way that they're thinking about their relationships with their other sibling. And so, just a simple rabbinic practice of was mm -hmm. questions, uh, open-ended exploratory questions where the aim is for them to explore their own relationship with their siblings. And at the end of the day, and you said this, Jim, an, an, an openness and acceptance of our lack of control in the situation, you know? Um, and yeah, I think that's important. I think I've said it before and I'll say it again. One of my favorite questions is tell me or help me understand what... Mm -hmm. um, you know, what you were feeling, what you were thinking, yeah. like, help me understand where you're coming from. And then tell me more about your feeling, you know, what you're really feeling. And then now what is the story you're telling yourself? Mm -hmm. You've said that before, but I think sometimes asking the right questions can provide a healthier discussion. So I love that. Can I tag one on the end of it? Please we, do. We, we know this, and that is be real clear about to your adult kids. Lean back content contemplatively and say, all right, now tell me what you're wanting from me around this. And you have a posture of curiosity. Don't do their work for them. Because we did a whole series. We did a, a podcast on divorce and don't take sides. We talked about amen. But the idea that who could blame your adult child for one of you? Because as a child, you were their, their advocate. You were the person they could ally with in safety. So who could not could blame them for them saying, I want you to take sides and don't be surprised by that. But say, what are you wanting from me? I they may not know. They may go, Well, I just and maybe they're honest and I want you to agree with me over my sibling. You know, and you better pause about how you respond to that. But to ask them, what do you want? It's that Nehemiah question with the King Art Exertion. He said, What do you really want here? And, and what would you say if they said, I really want you to pick a side? And I'm gonna say the side I'm for me, I know me just as daddy and granddaddy, I'm gonna say the side I'm going to pick is the side of health, the side of reconciliation, if it's possible, the side of listening and saying, I get to hold things because they're, I don't want to say what you said earlier, they're quit saying there's two sides to every story, but often with siblings, there there are two sides and I can hold that. I want to pick the side of the mental health part of that is that I don't have to take low hanging fruit or the, or the 
in the debate. I say there is debate, like debate on the end of a fishing pole, right? I don't want to take the bait and say, I, I need to, and I decide of saying, I need to think about this. Mm-hmm. And I just say to them, have you prayed about this? And you know what? I also am not going to be your counselor. Sometimes I see a kid just shut down, you know, or in my office. Why don't you invest and go take this to a couple of counseling sessions and talk about it? And by the way, said it many times, my kids have done intensives. Not with me, obviously. I've said, please go in and talk anything you want about daddy. Anything with me, anything you want to put where I've failed you. You hear car blanche, just go in and do whatever you want to do. But go there because they're coming to me and it's like, I'm not really the right person to referee or help mediate this in many cases and see if they're like, yeah, yeah, whatever, they move on. Often they're wanting me to do something and do their work in the way that they're not willing to do their own work. Okay, that's really good. Now, mm-hmm. we're going to make a hard turn here, yeah. and I want to make sure we get to this question, um, and I'm looking at you for specific reason, Okay, but help me understand the part that generational curses play mm. in family dynamics, and how do we go about breaking those? Yeah, that's really good. So the context of this comes probably around uh, Exodus 34, uh, starting in verse 5, and then uh, many other uh, passages in the Old Testament that talk about generational curses. Um, you know, one of the things I love to do, Lisa and Jim, is to get into the ancient historical context because the context is the key to help us understand what these words and phrases were actually meaning. So let's because start I'll there. I'll be honest, and I don't know if you feel this way, but I hear generational curses mm-hmm. and two things happen in my mind. That seems really big mm-hmm. and I don't feel equipped to deal with it, talk about it, or certainly to be like breaking these things. Yeah. So when the Old Testament is talking about generational curses, there's a specific context that it's talking about. And it's talking about fathers or families that um, have actually uh, essentially fallen over to idol worship. And so they had one point in time given all their worship to Yahweh, to God, and they have led their families away from following Yahweh to following the false gods of the nations. Mm -hmm. And in so doing, there is generational, and I'm going to give us modern a modern change of our language a little bit that's going to help, I think. Instead of calling it generational curses, I would call what we have today generational trauma. And, the, and this is how I would say it is that in the ancient world, the ancient context, for a father or a family to switch their allegiance to Yahweh would actually set into motion the next generations following that false god. Hmm. So literally, the father's iniquity right? The father's decision to follow idolatry would literally be passed on to the generations after because the son and the son and the son and the son and the family, all of them would be like, well, dad did this. He led us away from Yahweh and he sent us to worship Baal or Mo, whoever it might be. And so they would follow in that way. So you've got generational curses as a language, as a broad umbrella phrase to describe the actual traumatic consequences that take place when we act in ways that are unholy and dishonoring to God. So bring it into a modern day context, because I like what you said, thinking of it as generational trauma. trauma. And so bring it to a modern context. Maybe we're not out there, you know, bowing down to a false God or a graven image. But what what is it today? I'll, I'll give you a bunch of them. Um, and then, Jim, you're going to be tagged into this. Um, we might not be following Molech and uh, Baal and Ashtaroth and Ishtar, all these uh, false gods, um, but we are following false gods and we are being tempted by them. And today their names are pornography, their names are sexual addiction, their names are alcoholism, their names are opioid abuse. I mean, we can go on and on and on, we can, you know, um, addictions of, of all kinds. So generational trauma is... Um, you've got a, a family member who has given themselves over to alcoholism and that has become legitimately their God. Mm-hmm. And in so doing, these children have grown up in an environment where they have not felt the love of a father because that love that the father should have poured out on these children has been given over to the false God of alcoholism. And in so doing, it has created a traumatic experience for this child. So now this child is going to grow up and have insecurity and anxiety and questions of worth and dignity and identity. Do I deserve love, right? Do I, do I deserve, and then fighting to achieve that. 
it is now a consequence of trauma that is passed on because of of mismatched affection of the father or the mother, whoever it might be, that has a traumatic experience for this child. Another one is pornography is a massive one. Um, there's so many studies out there of children's first exposure to pornography being through a family member, mm. right? Think of the tragedy of that. When the person in your mind is the stalwart of honor and dignity and all this stuff, and then you realize yeah. you're a porn addict? Like, you you literally view women as objects. What is the traumatic impact on this child or this teenager, or whoever it might be, and and this is what I, and this is Jim, where I'd have to tag you in. I think what happens is you start from a place of righteous anger. I cannot believe to then going, hmm, that's interesting. Because mm -hmm. your eyes have been exposed to something that you were never intended to be exposed to and definitely never intended to be exposed to by through a vehicle or a means of somebody you trust that's supposed to actually protect you. Mm -hmm. And so now this becomes traumatic. But I think it's also looking to a parent for, you know, a, an authority figure in your life and watching how they cope with things. Yes. And so it's like, oh, you're angry, then you're going to drink. Oh, you're bored, you're going to drink. Oh, you're sad, then you're going to drink. And I think it's probably not a conscious choice, but through example, it's like, okay, so when I'm angry, then that's how I cope with it. And those things, and it does follow generation after generation after generation until someone decides to break it. Absolutely. Now, what do you have to say? Well, I'm going to speak to that last thing that you said, and I love, and you know, at our retreats at Haven Place, I always say this, that trauma, abuse, addiction, sins, whatever else, but pornography, it, it ran in my family line till it ran into me and it stops right here, right now. And then you got to do the work to make sure that stops. Uh, Romans 5, 12, therefore is by one man centered in the world, Adam, is so death passed upon um, all men for all of sin. So there is an idea that sin is obviously flowing down. David, in my sin did my mother conceive me. All of this stuff is flowing down. There are many rivers and tributaries of mental health issues flowing down, mental illness that's different than mental health issues flowing down, sometimes skipping a generation. Mm -hmm. Addictions, why, are, why does alcohol, alcoholism run in our family? Why are men misogynistic in our family? Why is there so much verbal, emotional abuse? You could go on and on. So stuff, there's a good theological word for it. Stuff is flowing down many rivers and many tributaries to get to where you are today. And Brother Joel did uh, eloquently reference, again, we'll talk about Bessel van der Kock, Dr. Peter Levine, and others in the trauma field, that the body keeps the score. And there are studies we even have with Jewish people who I have worked with and who are maybe in their mid-20s, late-20s, 30s, 40s, who were nowhere near Auschwitz. They were not in the Holocaust. But it is though because trauma is stored on the cellular level in the body that it looks exactly like they did. So all this stuff is flowing down. Sins, I do believe. The idea of curses, I don't know. You know, I don't know. But it's the idea of there, this stuff is flowing. So that's why in counseling, often to stop and say, hey, very gently, let's slow down and look back at your genealogy, it's all over the Bible. Let's look at the impact of how, let's look at early exposure to pornography, and we find out that where I am today, there's a bunch of stuff that's flowed into me. How do we dam that up and say it stops here, do the work around that, so it doesn't necessarily organically flow into the generations after? And Lisa, you talked about breaking generational curses, yeah. and I think it's really important to get to this point, that there is both this supernatural and spiritual reality and earthly. Mm -hmm. These things are paralleling each other consistently throughout the biblical text. In Eden, you've got a supernatural rebellion with the serpent and an earthly consequence with the human rebellion. It's consistently happening. Wow. I want to also talk about this in this way and, and be very clear on it. Jesus on the cross has broken sin and death's Amen. death grip on our throats. And so generational curses and, and all of these things that if you have put your, your faith in the risen Messiah, that he has conquered those things, that he has set you free from them in a sense. And then here's what I mean. There's a spiritual and there's an earthly. So you and I have the indwelling Holy Spirit and that the Holy Spirit and the people of God around us are cheering us on in these areas. And there's a real consequence to the impact of sin in our lives that we're still working out. So in a spiritual sense, we're set free. And in an earthly sense, like what Jimmy just said, 
God has given us common grace, mm -hmm. mental health, alcoholism, like AA. Um, if you think about uh, different clinical places that you can go to get support, medication, right? These are things that should not be frowned upon by believers when we view them to the lens of common grace that God has gifted us with yes. so that we can say, oh, we have the spiritual and earthly. And the earthly is actually a gift that God in his sovereignty has given to us to aid us in these things. And so um, I just want to point to the victory of Jesus on the cross without diminishing the real fallen reality the theological phrase is the already but not yet you know like there's this phrase in Ephesians that we're seated right now in the heavenly places with Jesus there's a spiritual reality that it's I think of it this way you know like when you're a kid and you're getting on a bus and you tell your friend like hey save me a seat like yeah like I know when I get on that bus Jim and Lisa they got my seat saved mm -hmm. I'm like it's almost as if I'm already there right now and I, that's the way I see this Jesus is doing for us mm -hmm. and so we live in the tension of the already but not yet I think one of the most important things with this whole conversation, and there's so much more we could say, but we do need to wrap it up, um, is to say this generational curse or this trauma fell on me, but I will not fall to it. Yeah. And so the first thing I believe is so crucial is to acknowledge that this is a reality and to admit my problem with it. And from there, once you acknowledge it and you admit it, that's where you can bring it into the light. And in the light, you can get counseling. You can go to AA. You can uh, find support groups. You can do the Bible study. You can go to intensives and, you know, take it incredibly serious. But if you're going to really make sure that it stops with you, then you have to do the work around it. And that's a big reason why we do therapy and theologies, because we want to help you work through what you're walking through. I know there's more questions and we'll get to those on other episodes, but I think for today is a really good and healthy place to land. Hi friend, thanks for watching this video. Proverbs 31 Ministries is a nonprofit organization and our mission is to meet you and women like you with scriptural truth and encouragement in the moments you need it most. Every day we offer free biblical resources, devotions, podcasts, videos, and more, all to help women around the world know the truth and live the truth because it changes everything. Find out more about how you can get involved today by visiting us at proverbs31.org.